Wishing to present an overall view of all of the possible approaches to the study of social phenomena, I developed what is now known as the theory of the three-tiered approach. The first of the three tiers or levels on which the social phenomena that surround us can be examined is the scientific tier, which rests on the laws of economic science and is free of value judgments. We have devoted our effort to it in all of our classes throughout this course. We could call this level the theoretical level. Second, there is the historical or evolutionary level, which consists of the study of how past events have unfolded with respect to human action and interaction. In short, human interaction is embodied in historical events over the different generations. And that unfolding of history also guides us and tells us which behaviors are coherent, which are successful and which are not. In addition, it shows us that civilizations that adopt certain patterned behaviors respectful of institutions like the family, private property, money and so on, are prosperous societies that prevail and absorb others, which fall behind or cannot advance because they repress entrepreneurship, voluntary exchanges, etc. So, we see that the conclusions of theory are the conclusions reached by economic scientists in terms of laws of tendency, ceteris paribus laws. For instance, other things being equal, minimum wage laws always cause unemployment and a misallocation of resources, and they hurt workers, especially the least qualified those they are intended to benefit. This is what economic science and theory indicate. But study, on the second level, the historical or evolutionary level, appears to lead to the same conclusions in many cases. Last, there is a third level of approach to social phenomena, and that is the ethical level, which we are discussing today. This level deals with what is right and what is wrong, without falling into the moral relativism ever present today the notion that anything goes and that people can take whatever position they wish and it will be just as respectable as any other. This is not the case. It is possible to construct a consensual ethics of right and wrong and we have identified several very promising avenues in this direction. Think of the person who says, listen, I see your point when you say economic science shows that institutional coercion destroys society. But even so, equality is what I like and value, even if it means the end of civilization. Is there nothing we can say to such a person? We can say nothing to him from the standpoint of economic science. From the standpoint of history, we can argue that such institutional coercion would do away with civilization. If he still stands his ground, we can say to him, you are an objectively bad person from the standpoint of ethics. You are a reprehensible person who is defending something that is against human nature. Therefore, to put you on your guard, we say this to you and to all others who share your position. You are objectively immoral. One could say you are ethically ill. Notice how the three disciplines reinforce each other. Moreover, each of the three levels of approach serves to somehow smooth the possible rough edges of the other two. I could construct an entire economic science in the abstract, but if I disregard history, I may commit many errors. In fact, to a large extent, neoclassical equilibrium theorists suffer from this defect. They have wished to construct a mathematics-based economics in a vacuum, a sort of nirvana, which has nothing to do with the institutional environment that surrounds us, in which concrete relationships exist between real human beings. Indeed, if anything characterizes the economic science of the Austrian school, it is that it both focuses on human beings as they really are, endowed with an innate creative capacity, and constitutes a theoretical discipline, though it rests on numerous elements. Austrians employ a multidisciplinary approach to economic science, and take into account law, history and so on. History is important, because it is enriching, and it directs us to the problems we should study. However, it is dangerous when someone wishes to be only a historian and attempts, without a grounding in theory, to interpret historical events. Historical events are so complex that they can be interpreted in a wide variety of ways, and your prior theoretical knowledge will determine how you interpret them. So, as you can see, there is a clear interaction between theory and history, and that is why Mises chose theory and history as the title for his famous work. Each discipline reinforces the other. Economic theory assists historians in their work, and history guides economic theorists in theirs. Each discipline strengthens and supports the other. 
smoothing its rough edges and rectifying its possible errors. If I want to build an absurd economic science in a vacuum, history will bring me back to reality, so I can focus my theory on something relevant. By the same token, if I want to trust history alone, and I am mistaken in my interpretations, I have theory to help me correctly interpret historical events. However, we also need the third tier or level of approach, which deals with what is ethical, what is just and unjust, what is right and wrong, what is in accordance with human nature and what contradicts human nature. Of course, I can also develop an absurd ethics in a vacuum, unconnected with reality, but history and theory will help me to better focus it and to know with relative certainty whether I am on the right track or the wrong one. This also works the other way around. Though economic science is free of value judgments, economists need the teachings of ethics as a point of reference. And what does economic science tell us? It tells us that to insist on organizing society from above, based on coercive commands, is to destroy society. Well, prima facie, or at first glance, this is quite significant. As I said at the beginning of this class, ethically speaking, the just thing is to defend the liberty of human beings, our creative and entrepreneurial capacity, the capacity to take possession of what we entrepreneurially create. Thus, ethics, history and theory are the three elements, the three levels of approach to social science. It may turn out that the conclusions we reach on these three levels seem to point in the same direction. We social scientists know that we must recognize the limitations of the human mind, and the fact that we are constantly in danger of erring, and must refine our theories again and again. However, if we see that conclusions in the area of ethics, in the area of evolutionary history, and in the area of economic theory point in the same direction, then we can be relatively certain that we are getting closer to the scientific truth. Thus, if you read any of my works, for instance, Socialism, Economic Calculation and Entrepreneurship, or Money, Bank Credit and Economic Cycles, you will see that in all of them, I use this multidisciplinary approach based on the three tiers or levels. Money, bank credit and economic cycles contains economic theory which explains that the manipulation of money, the reduction of interest rates and fractional reserve banking orchestrated by central banks lead to investment errors on a massive scale. The market sooner or later discovers these errors and reverses them in the form of a financial crisis followed by a profound economic recession. That is the theory. However, as you know, I also devote a large part of the book to history, two or three chapters. Historically, what has happened? Well, the review of historical events confirms what theory tells us in abstract terms. Also, there is the question of what is just and unjust. Is it just and ethical, based on general legal principles, for a depository to appropriate what is placed with him on demand deposit? And we see that according to general legal principles, in any deposit of a fungible good, whether oil, wheat or money, the depository who receives it must keep the entire tantundum, the equivalent in quantity and quality, at the disposal of the depositor. That is what ethics indicates. Notice that even without any knowledge of economic science or historical events, if we have clear ethical principles, they act as an automatic pilot, so to speak, for liberty just as the automatic pilot of a ship or an airplane keeps it moving in the right direction. And when we are scientifically mistaken, or we have not yet developed the science, or we lack historical experience, moral and ethical principles are all we have left to hold on to. So English speakers are quite right when they say, honesty is the best policy. The best and most practical policy is to rest on moral principles, that is, honesty. Likewise, if theory has been manipulated and a pack of Keynesian economists and macroeconomists see the manipulation of money as a great idea and history is wrongly interpreted, perhaps it is asserted that the Great Depression was a sign of the failure of capitalism and that the state made it possible to move forward, a completely erroneous interpretation of history. All you have left to hold on to is the ethical principle which tells you that ethical principles must be strictly adhered to. They are the automatic pilot for liberty. In this specific area, such principles indicate that when there is a demand deposit of money, like in any deposit of a fungible good, it is necessary to keep the tantundum available to the depositor, 
That is, a 100% reserve ratio must be maintained. If we abandon even moral principles, which are our last hope and all we have left to cling to, then we are totally lost. <laughs>